back to Screen Time. I'm Ro Khan. I'm Richard Grover. The great James Khan is about to join us. This is so cool for me, Ro. I mean, I've been so lucky as you have to speak to so many legendary, whether it's astronauts, politicians, actors, athletes, but I'd never had a chance to speak to James Caan, the great actor. People know him, of course, as Sonny Corleone from The Godfather. He was in Misery. We could go on and on and list his incredible roster of achievements. But I wanted to talk to James Caan about one of my favorite movies of all time and maybe my favorite Chicago movie of all time, Michael Mann's Thief. It's the 40th anniversary of the release of Thief, and we talked about that extensively. We'll get to that in just a moment, but first... Screen Time with Roan Roper is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com. The digital landscape is changing rapidly, and to compete in today's business environment, you need an experienced partner. Since 1995, AmericanEagle.com has partnered with companies of all sizes, offering web design, development, e-commerce, mobile apps, and digital marketing to drive your overall business success. Because they believe today's online world is your opportunity. Visit AmericanEagle.com today to get started. So it was 40 years ago, almost to the day, Ro, where we got the release of Michael Mann's Thief, the first film from the great director Michael Mann. He was 37 years old at the time. A Chicago set story starring James Caan as a career safe cracker and thief named Frank. He operates a used car dealership in Chicago, but that's just a front. And then he gets involved in this incredible story. And when you go back, if people haven't seen this movie, I know when people talk about heist movies, they talk about Heat, the Michael Mann movie. Right. I'm not sure that that's a better movie. It's a different movie than Thief. And the way Chicago is shown in this film, the the neon uh, rain-covered streets, the gritty daytime shots, it's one of the most beautiful and yet frightening and chilling and kind of realistic Chicago-set movies of all time. And if you don't live in Chicago or if you've never been to Chicago, it does not matter because it might as well have been Cleveland in the 1970s or Detroit or Boston or even parts of Brooklyn or Queens. It's got that urban, gritty, cloudy sort of feel Absolutely. that That's, we have about the 1970s. It's interesting you mentioned that because if it's not raining at night, it's cloudy during the day. And you see the famous Chicago bridges that are so beautiful in hundreds of movies, but here you see the bridges that are rusted iron that are on the <laughs> outskirts of town. Yeah, it's great. And the cast here is incredible, Ro. You've got James Caan in the lead performance, which he should have been nominated for Best Actor for as the career thief. Robert Prosky, who people got to know from television work, but is incredible as this villain, who the kind of mastermind who keeps the thief under his thumb. James Belushi in his best dramatic role as Frank's partner, as James Conn's partner. Tuesday Weld as his romantic interest. And then you see some familiar faces who are just starting off in their careers. Dennis Farina, at the time, was still a Chicago cop, acting as a consultant on the film, and they made him one of the lead henchmen oh, because he's, he's got that great Dennis Farina look. So he's got more gunshots than lines in the movie, but he's great. And you'll even see young William Peterson. He plays the bouncer at the Green Mill, a famous Chicago bar where the James Conn character hangs out. And he's got about eh, maybe about 25 seconds of screen time. You're like, that's the CSI guy and who went on to do a lot of other great things, including starring in a Michael Mann movie himself. So amazing cast. And we had a chance to talk to James Conn about Thief and about his incredible career. Okay, let's get to some of the best excerpts from the interview. So, Roe, in 1980, the year before the movie came out, before it went into production, James Conn is a huge star, of course. Michael Mann went on to become a legendary director, but hadn't really done that much. He was in his mid to late 30s. So I asked him, I asked James Conn about being coming aware of the project and why he got involved. I, I, I when he came to me, I, I, I bought three tomatoes. I don't know what the hell he was selling. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I was, um, I was doing this thing with Marsha Mason and I was outside my trail and some guy was sitting there in a little old wooden chair and with a manila envelope in his lap came up and it was obviously it was Michael. He had this thing, uh, this script in his lap and asked me to read it. And I looked him up. He had just finished a, a picture. He hadn't done any, I don't think, any big motion pictures. He did one picture for TV with a Jericho Mile, I think it was. Yep. yep. And um, I looked at that. It was pretty good. And so I read it and I just, you know, I, I love that script. It's, it was fantastic. And there was something I especially liked about it. 
and it was the form, you know, the form that it took. And this is getting too aesthetic, but <laughs> the minuet I learned in school has an A, B, A form. You know, the same eight bars at the end after the 16 bar break, right? So it's A, B, A. And this script had that A, B, A thing. In other words, this guy becomes this freak in jail because he knows nobody's going to fuck with him. And, you know, he don't give a shit about himself. He don't care about anybody, all of that. Then in, in the B form, he has this woman he loves and a baby now. So he can't afford to be that guy. So he has to go back to the A form. So he gets rid of all the shit he got in B. And I, I mean, that's the first thing I kind of, I didn't know. I, I don't usually get that cerebral with shit I read, but it was something really strange about it. And one of the things I love about Thief Row is the very particular way the characters talk and the language they use. Michael Mann wrote the screenplay, but it reminded me a lot of David Mamet type work. So I asked James about the particular way he has of speaking. These thieves and these kind of, kind of gangsters guy, they have what I call like these $4 words, you know, they're like, so there's a scene I have with, with the old man down in a basement where we just finished the score. And I say, um, the yield of my labor is in your pocket. Mm. I said, but that is okay because I elected it to do that. Right. Yeah. Now, did you hear anything wrong just now? The elected did. That's right. Elected it. And Michael never heard it. He's just one. He goes, wait a minute. What the fuck is that? <laughs> and I go, you know, all these guys that have these $4 words and they, you know, they try to abuse them. They're wrong. They don't say them right. So, yeah. I mean, we left it in because I love it. I elected it to do that, you know? Yeah. Like he was being really sophisticated. I love it. little stuff, stuff like that. Yeah. Michael was good with me with that, you know? And, yeah, the rhythms of that. I love that, you know, I don't think I'd ever heard someone say, I am Joe the boss of my own body. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just, that's brilliant stuff. Here we are 40 years after James Kahn played the character of Frank the Master Safecracker, but man, Ro, he talked me through doing one of the big safe cracking <laughs> scenes as if he had done it yesterday. And he said there was added pressure because some real life Chicago area wise guys and safe crackers were on the set as uh, technical advisors, if you uh -oh. will, watching him try to do this amazing break in that became the climactic scene of Thief. But when I did it, at the end, they made me crack this Richmond locket safe. Yeah. I came into work. I don't know if Jim was there or who was there. And the boys were there. They were all watching. And there was a Richmond, a big stand-up lock, you know, uh, safe. They said, bust it. So they go, oh, well, well who's going to show me? Good catch. And he busted. And I had to get, it was like a 200-pound magnetic drill. I had to throw that chain over the safe. Yeah. Clamp it on. Boom. Smack it on. It was a, a magnetic drill. Slapped it in. So now we learned when the drop is the copper piece that drops. When you drill through a thing, it, it's the drop that goes into the slot, you know, to lock yeah. the safe. And if you drill directly between the tumbler and the handle, that, that little X, yeah. if you drill there, you'll hit that drop. Wow. You'll drill through there, but now you got to be careful when you drill because now they're making these saves. You know, you're holding on hard. You got cold rolled steel or some shit and you're coming through it. And then there's copper behind it. And the copper's there for one reason, one reason only, to bind the drill, right? Right. It binds the drill. Then you go past that, and it's, then there's concrete for, for the fire. So you have to be really careful. So I, I went, I got through it. I opened it. Everybody saw these two big doors open, but then they had the two little doors inside. So I didn't know what to do. I just picked <laughs> up a chisel and a hammer, and went, boom, and I popped up two lot. And they all went, yay! They all applauded me. It was like... It was my, yeah, I got a curtain call. It was great. In the famous ending of Thief, Frank has taken care of business in more ways than one, but he had sent his wife, played by Tuesday Weld, and their baby away because he didn't want them to be in danger. But the way they played it up, it was almost as if he was never going to see them again. So I asked him, what does he think happens to Frank after that final shootout? Mike has him going back to go to Malibu, uh, going into a, a house on the beach where they are at the end. But then decided against it. And I think if you know the guy well enough, if he was that pig-headed about doing what he had to fulfill and he loved her and he loved the kid, I, I don't think there was any question where he was going, you know. I mean, me. 
Yeah. Yeah. You want you want to get fulfilled a little bit more to see them embrace or something. But I think uh, in keeping with the picture, I thought it was kind of cool. It's the 40th anniversary of the release of Thief, and we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of Brian's song, in which James Conn, of course, played Brian Piccolo, and Billy D. Williams played Gail Sayers. So I, I had to remind him that we were coming up on another big anniversary of a great film of his. My Chicago boys. Yeah, that's that's another one that it's, isn't it amazing 50 years down the road how much that is still. 50, right? yeah, holy shit. <laughs> but kiss. Buffon, Obradovich, yeah, they became my friend. We they came out here and they used to break down my front door on a Saturday. You know, like yeah. they thought that was really funny. Seriously, just Did pounded they really? in. They have a bunch of bears over on a Saturday afternoon. Huh? No, they would come out to play the game on Sunday, and they had a few hours over. They just for no reason come and break my door down. Wouldn't knock or anything. <laughs> hey, Burke. Hey. It's the 40th anniversary of one of the great underrated crime dramas of the early 1980s, Thief. You can, of course, buy it or rent it on demand or find it on Hulu or HBO Max. Floyd's, your haircut, your way. Floyd's 99 Barbershop has expert barbers and stylists who take pride in crafting the perfect cut every time. Walk in, book online, or give your shop a call. Learn about their safety practices at floydsbarbershop.com. Safety never looks so good. If it's Thursday, it's time for the Thursday Three. What a roster we have, Ro. At number three, it's an HBO documentary called The Last Cruise. It's only 40 minutes long, just one episode. It's pretty incredible, though. Now, you might recall in the early part of the pandemic, in early 2020, there was the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Remember, that was the cruise ship that got quarantined off the coast of oh, Japan yes. because they had had a couple of passengers test positive. Here's the incredible thing about modern day technology, Row. If a ship had been quarantined 30 years ago, we'd have what? Some Kodak film, maybe a couple of snapshots. A helicopter would have flown over it with a film crew yeah. and we'd see that. And Dan Rather reporting, you know, live from the scene or something like that. This day and age, of course, there's more than 1,000 crew members, more than 2,000 passengers. Everybody has a cell phone nowadays. So what this documentary does, they culled footage from about a half dozen passengers and four or five crew members, and they just weave that together to tell the story. Because it starts off with the typical thing on a cruise ship. Here's our stateroom. Oh, here's our balcony. Oh, look, there's a performance of, you know, rent happening right now in the main theater. <laughs> and then the crew members are like, you know, showing their cabins. And it really is like Titanic in this day and age. You know, if you're up, if you're up top in a stateroom, you've got a sunken tub and you've got a balcony and you've got a suite. And if you're a crew member, the truth is you're in a cabin the size of a prison cell. There's two people in every cabin. You're underground. so or, You're underwater. You're underwater. So there's yeah. no window or anything. But think about what happens when there's a pandemic and you're quarantined. Yes, it's still a huge inconvenience and very scary for the passengers, but they're still getting meals delivered to their room. Right. The, the, the crew they're is still, still working. The crew is still working, Ro. That is a great point. And it takes us through all that. So it's called The Last Cruise. It's on HBO. You got to check it out. When this was all happening... I was hosting a radio show. You were on the radio yeah. show. And we were talking to a woman and her husband, although he didn't say a lot, were on that cruise and talking about how they were going to get taken off and where they were going to go and what yeah. was going to happen. Yeah. And it was just all so novel at the moment. Nobody knew how this was going to end. There had been four reported cases when that ship set sail from Tokyo in late January. By the time the quarantine was over, we were in the early stages of the pandemic. And sadly, there were more than 700 cases aboard that ship and more than a dozen deaths. So it's it's pretty harrowing stuff, but it's a remarkable early record of what happened on that particular ship. Coming at number two. Number two is The Serpent. Ro, this is a Netflix limited dramatic series about a real life serial killer. And I honestly, I got to tell you, I never heard this story before, but there was a guy who was a gem dealer uh, in Bangkok in the mid-1970s. And this was a time when there were still tons of hippies going on these kind of bohemian road trips, Americans, Western Europeans. He would prey on them. He would become friends with them. He would poison them and make them sick. And then he would give them what he would call a cure. Oh, this will make you better. And actually would, in most cases, kill them. That way he would get their passports. He would get their traveler's checks. And he was able to go from country to country under assumed identities committing all these murders. And you got to remember, again, it's the mid-1970s, so you've got different embassies and Interpol. A lot of They couldn't work together. They couldn't figure out what was going on here. Incredible 
chilling. It's a dramatic series called The Serpent, but it's based on a real life case. And finally, at number one. Number one is Hemingway, the incredible uh, PBS docu-series from Ken Burns about Ernest Hemingway. Roe did this incredible interview. All you got to do is go back to the Screen Time archives all the way back to two days ago, and you'll find that interview. Ken Burns and his production partner, Lynn Novak, have done it again, Roe. This is a four-star documentary series. If you think you know Ernest Hemingway, watch all six hours of this and then get back to me, and we can talk about it. Because I thought... I knew a lot about Ernest Hemingway, and I would say 80% of what I found out from this documentary is new stuff. And what Ken Burns does, as he described in the podcast prior, if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it. He takes Ernest Hemingway and looks at him as a patient, essentially. He looks at him as a man who's struggling from a very early age with a narcissistic mother with a suicidal father, Mm -hmm. with a genetic imperative that he struggles with through his entire career as that great, facile mind creates word images that become actual three-dimensional thoughts in the reader's head in a way that no other American author has ever done. He should have been so happy and so satisfied, and yet he was so tortured. Absolutely. And I, I'll say this, too, about this documentary series, Ro. I read a lot of Hemingway as I was coming up, wanting to be a writer. I love the fact that Hemingway worked at the Kansas City Star when he was first coming up. But I could say, honestly, I don't think I've read anything by Ernest Hemingway in 25 years. And after watching this documentary series, I've got a stack of Hemingway books on the nightstand. I can't wait to reread A Farewell to Arms, among others. The Roan Rubber Podcast is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios. AmericanEagle.com is a full-service global digital agency providing best-in-class web design, development, hosting, digital marketing services, and so much more. Visit AmericanEagle.com for more information. And as always, we want to thank everybody for listening and especially our subscribers. Tell your friends, keep listening. We really appreciate it. Our executive producers are Tim Melanius and Renee Nelson, music and production director Brian Altimer. See you next time.